Ministers, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, good morning to you all and a warm welcome. It is indeed a pleasure to welcome you to um, IPI and to actually the 10th, time is flying, the 10th uh, annual Trigvili Symposium on this year promoting the freedom of religion or belief, organized in cooperation as always with the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, I also have uh, the great pleasure to welcome back to IPI my very good friend, the Foreign Minister of Norway, Birgi Brenda, who will shortly making opening remarks. Uh, I should um, uh, add here that, uh, Birgi, we all know that you are leaving the Foreign Ministry and going to become the President and CEO of uh, uh, the World Economic Forum, Davos in, uh, in popular terms. Uh, and I can assure you that you will also be invited back here to join us every year in your new capacity. Uh, we're also very honored to have with us here this morning um, a highly distinguished panel, which includes um, Retno Masudi, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Indonesia, uh, Nasser Burita, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Morocco. No, he's not here, I believe. Yeah. So, and then um, Prince Zaid Al Hussein, United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. Uh, I would like to say here that um, I was saying when we were uh, waiting to get in here that if somebody asked me who is the most courageous man in the world, I would without any doubt say Prince Aid. So, and then uh, we also are honored to have with us Mark Latzema uh, from the Minority Rights Group. Uh, as we approach the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it is important to reflect on the progress that has been made regarding the protection of human rights and the challenges that uh, remain. And may I, may I ask you to pay attention to the right-hand corner of your, uh, lower right-hand corner of your program, because there is a picture here, and, and it is from the 23rd of October, 1949, where uh, Trigvili, um, whose name is attached to this hall and also to this um, forum, he is laying down the cornerstone of the building across the street. And it's an interesting picture because what, it, what he's doing at the same time is that he's putting the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and a charter in wet cement in order to symbolize that these are the two pillars which the United Nations are resting on. So have a look at the picture. Um, at this year's symposium, we are looking at Article 18, focusing on freedom of religion and belief. Approximately three quarters of the world's population still live in countries with high restrictions when it comes to freedom of religion and freedom of belief. And we look forward to discussing today ways we can improve the situation by sharing best practices and ways for the international community to work together to build inclusive and diverse societies that respect and uphold the freedom of religion and belief. The biographies of our distinguished speakers are in your program. Um, and also after the panel, we will hear from some of our special guests this morning, including Lord Ahmed of Wimbledon, Minister of State for the Commonwealth and the UN in the United Kingdom, and Ulrich Vestergaard Knudsen, who is the Permanent Secretary of the State of Foreign Affairs in Denmark, and Abid Raja of Norway, member of the International Panel of Parliamentarians for Freedom of Religion or Belief. Uh, it is a pleasure and indeed an honor uh, to have you all with us here this morning and we are looking very much forward to your interventions. Before we begin, may I remind you to please silence your cell phones, though we encourage you to uh, tweet about the event using the hashtag UNGA, small x, IPI, and hashtag Trigvili. It is now my great pleasure to invite you, Berger, to deliver the first remark. So, Berger, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Tarja, and thank you to uh, IPI for co-organizing uh, this um, Trigvili symposium with Norway for the 10th time. So, in a anniversary uh, this year. Excellencies, friends, um, thank you for participating at the Trigvili Symposium uh, this morning. 
religious minorities are among uh, the most vulnerable people in the world. I think we uh, have seen this also the last year and all over the world. The Yazidis in Iraq, the Christian minorities in the Middle East, the Rohingyas in Myanmar, and Christians and Shia Muslims in Southeast, uh, South Asia. Approximately 70% of the world's population live in countries that in one way or the other restrict freedom of religion or belief. 70%. 70% of the world's population is an overwhelming number of people. This is not merely a question of Muslims against Christian or Jews. All groups are affected. Finding a solution is our moral imperative. We must not only stop the attacks on religious minorities, we must also actively promote freedom of religion and belief. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights states that everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. It also states that everyone has the right to manifest their religion or belief. Next year, we will celebrate the Declaration's 70th anniversary. Let us make use of this occasion to join forces and stand up for the people who are suffering serious violations of human rights every day. Human rights are universal. It is impossible to separate the right to freedom of religion or belief from other fundamental civil and political rights like the right to life, the right to privacy, and the right to freedom of assembly and expression. Religious freedom allows people to hold the beliefs they choose and to express them. The status of freedom of religion and belief is an indicator of the general human rights situation in any given country. An indicator of how much a country is willing to do protect its most vulnerable people. The Rohingya people are again fleeing Myanmar in large numbers. They're not the majority of Myanmar, but a very important ethnic minority. Their situation is dire and uncertain and is no the test of the leadership of a country how they also will protect a minority. Last week, the High Commissioner for Human Rights, very candidly, said that the recent events in Rakhine resemble a textbook example of ethnic cleansing. We share this concern. We call upon Myanmar to give full humanitarian access and to work to find a lasting solution to the conflict with the Rohingya. This is going to be a litmus test of the young democracy. The Copts in Egypt have been targets for deadly violence throughout history. After Mubarak fell in 2011, the violence increased. The bombing of a Coptic church in Palms Sunday this year is only one example of horrific attack on the religious group. This one is the one of the most symbolic of days. The world watched in horror when the true scale of ISIL's atrocities toward the Yazidis was revealed. There are no one words, there are no words to describe the suffering. Women and girls have been raped and forced into sex slavery, children forced to be soldiers, entire Yazidi families eradicated. A UN panel has described the atrocities as a genocide. The fact that we are using the words genocide and ethnic cleansing to describe events unfolding in 2017, 70 years after the adaptation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, is a disgrace. 
It is important that we have the focus on these issues and earlier this year, my country Norway doubled its support for religious minorities to 40 million Norwegian kroner a year. Norway is committed to identifying and supporting national, regional and global measures that promote greater respect for freedom of religion and belief worldwide. One such measure is the Network of International Parliamentarians for the Freedom of Religion or Belief, which is led by a Norwegian member of parliament, Abid Raja, here on the front uh, row. He will also speak uh, later. <coughs> we should mobilize all parliamentarians globally. That is a good start. And ministers should be held accountable in the parliaments every week, every day. There are question time. Lack of religion, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that only because I'm living into <laughs> something new. I've been facing this for almost 10 years as a minister, and I kind of like it. Accountability. Lack of religious freedom is a serious breach of human rights that affects too many people across the world. The fact that this is still the case 70 years after the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is completely unacceptable. To quote the UN Special Rapporteur on freedom of religion, collective re religious hatred is not a natural phenomenon. It is caused by human action. It is man-made. We cannot allow this to continue. It's our moral obligation to work for a solution. I really look forward to this discussion. And I'm very thankful to the distinguished panel, very thankful to all of you, because we are competing with a lot of other topics also this morning. But personally, I think this is the most consequential meeting this morning. And thank you for allowing us to put this on the agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much, Berger, for those very inspiring words. And now, before uh, we turn to the panel, let me remind you that I will open the floor for questions and answers following the presentations. If you are joining us uh, online, you're welcome to tweet your questions or comments. We will now hear from uh, Ratna Masuri, who is the Foreign Minister, of course, of uh, Foreign Minister of Foreign Affairs of Indonesia. Ratna, you have the floor. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for inviting me to be one of the uh, panelists for today's uh, symposium. I would like to first of all introduce uh, myself. My name is Rutno Marsudi. I'm a Muslim, but I live in a very diverse family and a very diverse society. Coming from Indonesia, if you talk about Indonesia, it is a diverse country with more than 300 ethnic groups, 700 spoken languages, and embraces all six major religions and belief. So we call that the uh, freedom of religions and belief is in the DNA of Indonesia, ever since before the Republic was born in 1945. Our founding fathers, the Indonesian founding fathers, has built a constitutional foundation for the respect and protection of traditions, cultures, and religions, even three years before the Universal Declaration on Human Rights was adopted. Colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Indonesia is the home of the largest Muslim population on earth. Our population is around 260 million and more than 85% are Muslim. And yet it is also homeland of sizable and devoted Christian, Catholics, Hindus, Buddhists, Confucius, and many more local beliefs. It is tolerance that holds Indonesia, holds us together 
as one nation. Therefore, our effort to protect the right to freedom and religion and belief must be in tandem with our works in nurturing tolerance. So tolerance becomes very important. And it is especially true in the face of xenophobia, Islamophobia, and defamation. Promoting the uh, spirit of uh, tolerance as well as freedom of religions and belief is an effective tool against religious extremism. Colleagues, religious extremism have falsely used religion to justify their inhuman causes. They have misused and abused the guarantee of freedom of expression promised by democracy to attack, slander, and promote hate species, speeches. Politics of identity is also often used in time of election. Short-sighted politicians exploit this issue for their own political gains. And fortunately, again fortunately, some wise leaders manage to preserve unity, even sustain social and religious harmony. And we need as many wise leaders as possible in this globe. I believe that the essence of every religion is the message of peace and humanity. However, geopolitical rivalries have affected the landscape of our religious harmony. Indonesia is now at the receiving end of this impact. Our foundation of tolerance is being challenged. It is also challenged for almost every country. And as a response, of course, the government is trying its, uh, our best to continue to strengthen our rule of law. Rule of law protects both freedom of expression and of religions. As a democracy, the government also continue to work inclusively with the society, religious leaders, mass organization, including in Indonesia, we have two very big organization of uh, uh, Muslim, that is the Nahdlatul Ulama and Muhammadiyah. However, the exercise of religions and belief is not without limit. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights clearly provides such limitation. The exercise of one religion and exp or expression must be considered in relation to the right of others. With such balance is upset, religious fanatism, social conflict, and discord tend to raise. In this regard, the government of Indonesia has taken measures, including the establishment of Forum of Interreligious Harmony in all of our provinces across Indonesia, where community members, interreligious leaders, and officials work together to promote interreligious harmony. Guideline to regulate establishment of houses of worship. Again, the aim is to maintain the social harmony. The issuance of the chief police regulation that prohibits hate speech. Colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, some violent extremist group have turned transnational in nature. Thus, our response requires international cooperation. On our part, Indonesia continues to strengthen our cooperation with other countries. For example, Indonesia and Norway had established a bilateral dialogue since 2002, 
one of the focuses is on interreligious harmony. And at grassroots level, our civil society also active in building international network and partnership. And at global level, the UN bears an important role to promote constructive dialogue on this issue. Freedom of religion and belief interlink both freedom of expression and the need to address intolerance, discrimination, stigmatization, and hate speech. An international consensus must be fostered in this uh, matter. So I just hope that the voice raised by this symposium can echo beyond our room and reach those on the other side. So I thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Retno. You pointed out um, the need for as many wise leaders as possible in the world, and I think we are all very happy to have you as one of those wise leaders in the world. And I will now turn to the most courageous man in the world, Prince Aid. Uh, thank you, Terry. I'm delighted to be back here again. No high-level segment for me seems complete I'm, unless I'm on a panel uh, at IPI sitting next to Terrier and uh, Borga Brenda has to be on it. <laughs> I'm a bit worried uh, if uh, how the complexion may change now that he'll be representing the World Economic Forum and the two of us coming from Geneva will have identical views. Well, we'll have identical views anyway. And for the occasion I've been... impartial. That's right. <laughs> we'll try and make it not. Um, <laughs> And I'm wearing my, my Norwegian sort of colors today for the occasion as well. Um, excellencies, colleagues and friends, I mean, humanity uh, throughout history found comfort and guidance in religious and ethical uh, systems of thought. Uh, these have been among the roots of international human rights law and international humanitarian law. But the link uh, between our modern thinking on human, on human rights and diversity of religion and uh, belief is not only historical. Without the freedom to believe, there is no freedom of thought. In other words, without this essential human right, other human rights may be in jeopardy. And this is what we mean when we say that human rights are interdependent, interrelated, and uh, indivisible. Like uh, everyone here, I'm fully aware that individuals have often instrumentalized religious beliefs to divide, exclude, persecute, and kill. But I am convinced that uh, religious leaders with their considerable influence over minds of millions of people uh, can be consequential human rights uh, actors in the world today. While refraining uh, from politicizing religious beliefs, they can and should have real positive impact on the human rights landscape. And over the past year, my office has organized a series of meetings among faith-based and civil society actors seeking to help them establish a respectful common ground on essential principles of human dignity, equality, and justice. Uh, in March, they uh, adopted the Beirut uh, Declaration and its 18 commitments on faithful rights. And I'm grateful to the support offered by the government of Morocco uh, to this initiative. We aim to uh, foster peaceful societies which uphold diversity of belief, uh, behavior, and thought as an intrinsic and inalienable right of all, all their people. Uh, respect for religious diversity is threatened today in an increasing number of societies, both by the rise of violent religious extremists and by a wave of chauvinistic nationalistic thinking. Both these trends threaten religious and ethnic minorities with heightened discrimination and uh, even violence. And as uh, Borga led, uh, alluded to uh, just moments ago, Daesh uh, inflicts genocide on the Yazidis, the Rohingya uh, of Myanmar suffer what amounts to be ethnic cleansing. The anti-Balaka and ex-Seleka are murdering the people of the other, uh, all of whom are the people of the Central African Republic. In other words, they are murdering themselves. In a number of other countries, 
religious minorities justifiably fear extreme violence and persecution. In other words, they face uh, marginalization, humiliation, unfair access to basic services. And clearly, uh, every situation is different, but always to foster trust between communities as well as mutual reliance and cooperation uh, requires a deep and broad effort of education, far-sighted leadership and justice based on equality of all before the law. To build trust in a shared future, structural injustices in pol politics, law, uh, the economy and uh, basic services must be addressed. To achieve activism requires a broad civil society space. Crucially, religious and other minorities must be free to participate fully in all our areas of society, although it must also be clear that they should not impose their beliefs on others. The struggle against discrimination is at the heart of the human rights agenda, and it can be supported by interventions across the whole spectrum of rights, civil, cultural, economic, political, and social measures, which come together to support justice, uh, human dignity and equality. I thank you. Thank you very much, Said, for uh, words of uh, wisdom. Next, we will hear from Mark Latimer, who is the executive director of Minority Rights Group, a group that works with 150 partner organizations over 60 countries worldwide. So, Mark, we look forward to hear your reflections. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Earlier this year, I was in Baghdad having lunch with a member of uh, the Iraqi parliament. He's a member of the IDP committee. Uh, I've known him for well over 10 years. He was also an MP in Iraq's first parliament, uh, where he was a member of the Human Rights Committee. Uh, he comes from a minority community. And I remember him saying back in 2006, uh, he showed me around the parliament and he said, you know, we lived for two decades under Saddam, but now we are a democracy, and this is my parliament. So earlier this year, I asked him how things were going. I know that his community had suffered a lot in the intervening period. Mass bombings, killing as many as 50 at one time. And in 2014, the community was expelled en masse uh, from the north of Iraq in the ISIS advance. Uh, but he said, now, of course, I have my own militia. He has a force of over 2,000 Shia fighters. I thought to myself, how did we get here when one of the staunchest defenders of human rights in Iraqi politics now runs his own private religious army? Well, to answer that question, uh, I just wanted to make three very brief points this morning. The first one is that when we speak about the freedom of religion and belief, it isn't just about the freedom to worship and to witness. Yes, those are really vital rights, and restrictions on those rights are often an indicator of worse to follow. But if you really look at the face of religious rights violations in the world today, what you see, and it's already been mentioned by a number of speakers this morning, is the targeted persecution of whole communities on account of their identity, their religious identity. If we recognize that now, we're also remarkably slow to try and know what to do about it. And I think one of the reasons uh, is because in certainly in North America and in Europe, we are very slow to recognize what religion means to people. We think about it in terms of individual conscience, and we don't recognize that in many parts of the world, religion is also a cultural fact people are, into which people are born and in which they will spend the rest of their lives. I think many human rights advocates, many on our side, are also very reluctant to recognize the implication of what it means for whole groups to have rights. 
It's not just about individual rights, it's about the rights of the collectivity, of the group that need to be protected. That's hugely important. We have an international convention on the elimination of racial discrimination that looks at discrimination, persecution targeted by ethnicity or race. There is no instrument on religious discrimination. But the second point I wanted to make is that if it isn't all about the freedom of uh, worship, in many ways it isn't really about religion at all. If you see now what's happening in Rakhine State, the mass expulsion of the Rohingya, they are not being targeted because of some disagreement about theology. They are not being uh, expelled at gunpoint because someone has a different view of their religion. People want their land. Even in Iraq, I often feel that we are in danger of taking ISIS too literally at its own description. Yes, religion is used to mobilize communities. Yes, religion is obviously used to recruit, including internationally. But why have all of those minority communities been expelled from their lands? It's because they are the fertile lands of the plain. They hold the key, the strategic key, both to the Kurdish mountains and to the great cities of Mosul and Baghdad. And that leads me to my third point. If it isn't all about religion, then I think we should be very wary about abandoning human rights answers, human rights solutions, in favor of religious solutions. It is maybe an obvious tendency, a natural tendency for those working on these issues to seek solutions that are religious in nature. But there is a problem. Even with interreligious dialogue, it's something you often hear said at the General Assembly. Interreligious dialogue is a wonderful thing. I think there should be more of it. But it is not sufficient. Think about what happens when you place the protection of a particular community in the hands of a representative who is a religious leader. Do they represent all the members of that community? Do they represent the non-religious in the community? Do they represent the non-conformists? What happens to women's rights when we leave the decisions in the hands of the men with the big beards? That description, incidentally, is not mine. It comes from the former UN Special Rapporteur on Religion and Belief. He, he, he was coming from an interreligious group of Muslims, Christians, and Jews, I think in the Middle East. And he said to me, Mark, you know, these guys have some serious disagreements, but they all look very similar. <laughs> we particularly need to be wary of religious solutions when they focus on the whole religion. There is this tendency to say that if the religion is the problem, then we need to make the religion pay amends. That is the logic of collective punishment, and it is what drives these conflicts, not just in Iraq, but in Yemen, in much of Syria, in many conflicts across Asia from the West right through to Southeast Asia. And then we have the militarization, the mobilization of communities in the extreme. I think we need to make a distinction between those three things. The individual right to freedom of religion and belief, the collective persecution of whole communities on account of their identity, and finally, the mobilization of communities for political purposes using religion. They, have different, they are different phenomena. They are clearly related, but they have different solutions. And we need to be very careful about abandoning the human rights solutions in favor of others which may lead you in completely different directions. I'll just finish by saying earlier this year 
I, it was during the, um, the battle for West Mosul, I visited some of the territories on the east side of the river that had been taken back from ISIS. They were deserted. You went through one deserted village after another ghost town. There were no civilians. What there were were militias. Most of them were Shia militias, some of them were Christian militias, there were some Yazidi militias, all of them organized by religion or sect. Often you went through a check, there were two checkpoints next door to each other. They played the game of who, whose militia flag was the higher. Now, for the Sunni Arabs leaving Mosul, fleeing Mosul, they had to run the gauntlet of those militias. I spoke to some of the commanders on the ground. None of them would admit to detaining people. But they said, we don't let them stay. We just move them along the road. Now, I don't think Iraq is finished. I think there is still hope for the country. But if we allow that situation to continue, it is going to get very bad indeed. It is going to be poisonous for freedom of religion and belief. And we have to ask ourselves this question. If the international community has helped Iraq defeat ISIS, is it in danger of creating a society organized along lines which would seem very familiar to those ISIS leaders? Thank you. Thank you very much for a very thoughtful, very powerful, but rather depressing uh, intervention. <laughs> um, um, we will now hear from our special uh, guest this morning, and we will first listen to Lord Ahmad of Wimbledon, who is the Minister for State for Commonwealth and the United Nations. You have the floor, sir. Well, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and thank you. Before I go any further, I think it's important to state your claim as to your relationship with Norway. And Foreign Minister, Your Excellency, you've both uh, mentioned that. Well, uh, my stake is, here, here we go with it, how tenuous I let others judge. I was formerly the aviation minister for the UK. And as I arrived in Washington one morning, my official told me I had to bat for Norwegian. I, of course, was a bit perplexed by asking the question, but we're delighted as we position ourselves as Global Britain, that Norwegian are developing their Gatwick hub in London, and long may it continue to prosper. So there you go, uh, my, my Norwegian credentials pinned to the mast. But whilst we talk about a Global Britain, it's also the global world we live in. And what brings us together, and I thank the Government of Norway and the International Peace Institute and you, sir, Mr. Chairman, for inviting me here, is about promoting freedom of religion and belief. It's a priority for our government. As our Prime Minister, Mrs May, said in her Easter message, and I quote, we must do more to stand up for the freedom of people of all religions to practice their beliefs openly, in peace and safety. And we've heard from our various contributions this morning about the commitment we have. But this is also a personal priority for me. I'm the minister for human rights in the UK government, and I'm the minister for freedom of religion or belief, and I'm proud of that. But it's not just about being proud, it's about delivering. The UK believes very strongly that the protection and promotion of the freedom of religion or belief is essential in tackling the causes of extremism because it helps to build more resilient societies. Hi, Commissioner, you and I have already talked about this. One of the early phrases that I came across when I first entered public life was that someone said to me, Tariq, we must be intolerant of intolerance. And that rings true on this issue more than anything else. Because if we nip it in the bud, we stop that intolerance, the first inklings of intolerance, the first looking at someone feeling they shouldn't be in that room. If we stop that and nip it in the bud, that intolerance will not Rear its, ugly, uh, rear, rear its ugly head as discrimination. That discrimination will not turn into persecution, and that persecution will not turn into human suffering, which unfortunately we see in many parts of the world. Indeed, as we look across the globe, three in four people live in countries where their own governments, sadly, 
or state institutions impose such restrictions. People are denied access to jobs, to education. They're discriminated against. In Russia, Jehovah's Witnesses have been branded extremists and banned by the Supreme Court. In Pakistan, we have seen the Hazari community, the Amdi Muslim community. We've seen the Christians, the Coptic Christians of Egypt. And of course, as we look elsewhere, we've seen the human suffering of the Yazidis in Iraq. And these are just a number of the challenges, the suffering, the persecution that we face. And elsewhere, it's not just state actors that are targeting the people of certain faiths, as we've seen in Iraq. There are many who claim to be hijacking, who claim to be representing a faith, but they are in fact hijacking that faith. They claim to act in the name of the faith, use that faith. They do not use the faith, they abuse the faith. And that must be called out for what it is. And that is so vital why all governments, collectively with civil society, NGOs, all of us must pledge and then deliver on our commitments to promote freedom of religion and belief. In the UK, we are doing that, both multilaterally through the UN and the Human Rights Council, and bilaterally through the activities of our extensive diplomatic network. And I can assure you, we are very much aware about the desperate plight of the Rohingya Muslims in Burma, as we are all witnessing today. We also ensure that our diplomatic staff receive the kind of training and guidance, the religious literacy to inform their work in developing projects to promote freedom of religion or belief. One of these projects, if I may, is helping secondary school teachers in the Middle East and North Africa to develop lesson plans to teach children about tolerance, but not just about tolerance, about understanding the right to freedom, freedom of religion or belief. Another example of our work in this area was the conference hosted last year. It brought together a wide range of faith leaders and experts to examine how societies that are di diverse and inclusive must become more resilient to violent extremism. It produced a number of new ideas that participants could put in place. And finally, I'd like to highlight one strand of our work in particular, and that is the campaign to bring Daesh to justice. It was launched by our Foreign Secretary, Boris Johnson, and his counterpart from Iraq at last year's UN General Assembly. In response to Daesh's appalling actions, the beheadings we've seen, the rapes we've seen, this isn't just about persecution, this is about what is happening in our world today, and the dreadful, the appalling, inhumane treatment of religious minorities, and yes, of other Muslims in Syria, in Iraq as well. Today, as we reflect one year on, the UN Security Council will take a step closer to ensuring that Daesh is held to account for its crimes. Today, states will vote on a milestone resolution drafted by the United Kingdom. This resolution will send a UN-led investigative team to Iraq to help gather evidence of atrocities and support Iraq to bring Daesh to justice. And I would like to take this opportunity to urge all states to support this resolution and its implementation. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Chairman, I hope in the brief time I've had, I've illustrated in one or two areas the importance the UK government attaches to this important issue. We believe strongly that not only does it do the right thing, it improves the lives of individuals and communities, it makes them more resilient and stronger and, yes, unified in the face of extremism. But it means that we must promote this interest everywhere. You know, if I may finish on a personal anecdote, they often say mothers know best. When I was a young boy, about five years ago, <laughs> that's what it seems sometimes. But I was at primary school. I was eight or nine, and I came back, and we were studying Judaism at school. And I was a bit confused. Some may argue at times, Tarek, you still appear to resemble that trait today. But I sat down, and I said to my mother, I said, Ami, Judaism, I'm Muslim. I go to a school called Holy Trinity, which by its name is a giveaway. It was a Church of England school. And here we're learning about 
the faith of Judaism. So my mother sat me down, gave me something to eat and a glass of milk, which all mothers know best. And then she said to me, Beta, which means son, when we build a house, what do we do? I said, yeah, mum, we sort of put down a foundation. She said, indeed. She goes, what do we do after that? And I thought, this is getting a bit complicated. It wasn't the kind of question I was asking, you know, seeking for my mother. She's asking me now. I said, well, mum, you put the walls in. And she said, yes. And then at the end of it, you put on the roof to that house. She said, what you're learning at school is the foundation of that house. For the foundation of our faith of Islam is Judaism. Without Judaism, that foundation, the walls of the faith of Christianity could not have been built. And without the walls of Christianity, the roof of Islam could have not completed the house of Abraham. The doors and windows represent other faiths and communities to ensure we always look inwards and look outwards. So that, in my mind, to a young seven or eight year old, showed me that, that religion is in conflict. It showed me how religions can work together, how they can collaborate together, and how they build houses and communities together. They say mothers knows, be knows best, and here I am on an international stage talking about something a mother shared with her eight-year-old son. But perhaps the solutions are closer to home than we think. Thank you. Thank you very much for those extraordinary and uh, very passionate uh, words. So, uh, Mr. Minister for Freedom of Religion, keep up the good work. Thank you. May I now move to uh, Ulrich Vestergaard Knudsen, who is the Permanent Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs of Denmark. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, I will follow your lead and, and, and start my intervention to uh, coming clean on the relationship to Norway. Um, <laughs> As, as, as Bo and Terje will, will know, uh, uh, Denmark uh, is a country who held Norway under rule for several centuries. Um, but I will admit this morning to being completely under your rule, at least for a couple of hours. So <laughs> thanks to both of you uh, for, for, your, for your leadership um, on, the, on this particular issue. Uh, the freedom. 400 years. It was only 400 years. So I can barely, sp I can spare two hours. That's, uh, that's fine, Bo. The, the freedom of religion or, uh, uh, or belief is a fundamental freedom. I think we all uh, agree on that. Everyone shall have the right to freely choose his or her religion, or uh, no religion indeed, without fear of persecution or discrimination. It is one of the essential fabrics uh, of a free society. Despite increased uh, awareness and some progress in some areas, Denmark still shares the serious concern regarding the continuing acts of intolerance and violence based on religion uh, or belief against individuals. That, of course, also includes the acts of uh, intolerance and violence against persons belonging to religious communities uh, and religious minorities around the world, not least. Freedom of religion uh, or belief is a field in which Denmark has traditionally been very, very active. That goes uh, multilaterally, uh, bilaterally, and also through uh, our development, uh, development aid and, and other initiatives. I'll mention just briefly three examples. Uh, for instance, uh, firstly, our support uh, of the mandate of the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion uh, or Belief. Secondly, by raising the issue, of course, in as many bilateral consultations as possible. And thirdly, through development aid to a range of projects promoting interreligious dialogue and supporting the indispensable work of civil society uh, organizations. I see a lot of you in the room here today. Thank you. But this is also an area where we want to do more. Um, we are um, a candidate for a, a seat in the Human Rights Council for the elections in 2018. If we are successful, and we have, uh, we have reason to believe we will be because it's a Nordic candidate, so both Bo and, and, and Terry are helping us, I hope, even despite my introductory remarks. Um, so we are uh, hopeful that we can do even more on human rights when, when, when we hopefully gain a seat on the Human Rights Council. We also have uh, a new uh, initiative uh, underway uh, just last month. Several new measures were included in the proposal for our National Finance Act. It included a strengthening of existing uh, development aid in the field 
but as something new, at least in Denmark, it also introduced funds for dedicated expertise and personnel in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So we're basically contemplating um, appointing an ambassador uh, for religious uh, minorities, and, and we look forward to, to, to cooperating with many of you on, on that. It's an initiative that uh, aims to uh, strengthen our work with the international uh, community uh, to ensure freedom of religion uh, uh, or belief. We uh, hope that uh, we can work with uh, other nations, including Norway, and the organizations present here today and also outside the room. It's important that we do build as many alliances uh, as possible on this very important issue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, those um, um, enlightening words, also for your colonial perspectives. <laughs> <laughs> And it's now, it is now my pleasure indeed to recognize Abid Raja, actually of Norway, who is a member of the, the International Panel of Parliamentarians for Freedom of Religion or Belief in Norway. You have the floor. Thank you. I'm the most typical Norwegian you'll get. <laughs> I'm saying, I usually I joke about I'm the descendant of the brown Vikings, but I... <laughs> Well, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, it's a great pleasure for me to be here. I, I would like to start thanking Berge Brende for taking this initiative and also IPI to putting this uh, topic on the agenda. In an ideal world, it would not have been necessary for us to be here, actually. In this ideal world, we would have had peace, we would have had the freedom to expression, freedom to worship, freedom of religion. And my good friend here, Lord Ahmed, pointed out the situation in Pakistan. And if you had listened to one of the leaders of Pakistan, the founder of the Pakistan himself, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, in 1947, he said, you are free to go to your temples. You are free to go to your mosques. You may belong to any religion, caste, or creed. That has nothing to do with the business of the state. If that was the situation, it would have, it would have been so much better. And we would not have been here. It wouldn't have been necessary. But in the situation of Pakistan, we know the Ahmadi community, the community of the Lord himself is, is under great suppression. And one of the things that actually started up this group was the, the killing of uh, the minister, uh, Shabazz Clement Bhatti himself, minority minister working to promote freedom of religion in Pakistan, killed. I represent IP, uh, IPP, International Panel of Parliamentarians. I'm born in a free country, the free country of Norway. Uh, I can speak freely without any suppression at all in Norway. The, most, the, 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 the worst thing can happen is that the voters won't vote for you. But I just uh, re-won my election last Monday, so I have four more years to go. Uh, <laughs> but in the free country, we, we, were four, we were five parliamentarians. Me from Norway, from Brazil, from Canada, from Turkey, uh, and, and from England. We said together three years ago and said, we want to start a global movement among parliamentarians around the globe to promote freedom of religion. So five small people from uh, small parties uh, said, this is what we're going to do. And last year, over 65 countries were represented with 100 parliamentarians and Angela Merkel opened our large conference in Berlin. I think we are moving forward. Now we have caucuses in over 10 countries where all, par all parliamentary groups have joined in to promote this freedom of religion. We are writing advocacy letters, and I believe uh, several of you work in, in, in diplomacy. If you get a letter from, signed from 30 MPs from 30 different countries, sent by, by their letterhead from 30 different uh, parliaments, I guess it will be get noticed. And we know that one of the letters we sent to Sudan uh, did help to release a pastor. We are organizing also uh, regional conferences. We are sending delegations. Now, uh, only in two weeks' time, we are having a conference uh, with ASEAN countries. Uh, we know that one of the things that I would like, uh, like to ask the, the panel is, how can the panel and the international society be of help to put forward mechanisms in ASEAN countries so the breaches of human rights can be uh, brought to justice? We, I've been working closely with, with Myanmar. We sent a delegation there last year uh, to stand up for one of our colleagues, Shwe Mang. He's not here with us today. He's from Myanmar. He's Rohingya. He was an MP when we started up three years ago. He was stripped from his rights to have this nationality. He's in exile now. He cannot go back to Myanmar. And we have all seen the heartbreaking scenes where we see over 200 villages has been burned. We know half a million people have driven away from their homes. And we know the state leader herself is actually 
well, sometimes saying it's a fake news, sometimes saying we don't understand why the people, the young people are fleeing. At the same time, we are hearing the Bangladeshi government saying they're putting up mines so people don't return back. And at the same time, we know they're not putting the blame on the culprits themselves who are actually doing the, the, the abuses on children, on men, on innocent uh, women, and they're driving them away from the... As I think this is a very much important word that Al Hussein used uh, for the world to say that this is ethnic cleansing that's going on and the world needs to step up to show that we can actually be a change also for the Muslim minorities. When it comes to freedom of religion, usually uh, it's a, a little problem in a uh, in few Muslim countries. I can say that I'm a Sunni Muslim. I, I feel I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm free to say that. It's a little problem in a lot of Muslim countries. But I think a lot of Muslim countries will also like to see the international society stand up for the Muslim minority in Myanmar. And in many ways, that is also a lachmus test for to see what the world are uh, able to do in, 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 that, in that area. We're also sending a delegation to Nepal uh, next month with parliamentarians from uh, five different continents. And here today with us, I have uh, 11 uh, ladies, if you can rise up, ladies. Uh, you can say they are from uh, all parts of the world. They're from uh, MPs from five different continents, from uh, Malaysia, Pakistan, Indonesia, Bangkok, we have uh, South Africa. And one of the questions for the panel would be, what are your thoughts about the linkage between gender and freedom of religion or belief? And in the, in the end, I would like to uh, ask the, the panel as well, how can the international panel of parliamentarians, how can we be of assistance for the work you are doing, what can we do more? What are your thoughts about what, what, how can we actually achieve the rights for freedom of religion for all, all over the globe? Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Viking, for those very uh, energizing and uh, imperative words. Thank you. Uh, I, before I open the floor, I, I've been informed by Ratno that she, unfortunately, will have to leave us for an even more important meeting than the one we are having here. But before you go, I will not lose the opportunity to ask you about the uh, Rahina state humanitarian crisis. Could you enlighten us a little bit about the situation there before you go? Well, thank you very much, uh, Rod. Uh, colleagues, uh, as you know that the situation in Rakhine State underground is not, at least, is not getting better yet. The new cycles of violence started on the uh, 25th of August. But the response from the uh, military is also out of proportion. That makes the situation now even uh, getting uh, worse. I did what I call the uh, marathon diplomacy because started from the uh, 3rd of September until 5th of September, I flew to Myanmar. I met with the commander in chief, state councillor, the three ministers, and also I met with the UN representative ambassadors in Yangon in Napido. Then from Yangon Napido, I flew to uh, Dhaka to meet with the prime minister, the foreign minister, the UNHCR, the IOM, and other stakeholders to listen to them about what is the situation of refugee, especially on the border of Bangladesh and Myanmar, especially on the territory of uh, Myanmar. From what I heard and from the experience that Indonesia had, the situation in Myanmar is uh, very complex. The last time that I call on the ground from Sitwe, the communal tension remains very high. So during my discussion with the authority of Myanmar, uh, I propose what I call the uh, formula four plus one for Rakhine State. The formula plus one is first is about peace and stability. The second one is the uh, maximum self-restraint and no use of force. Third one, is protection for all, regardless religious and ethnicity background. 
And then the fourth one is the access to humanitarian assistance. The plus one is the implementation of uh, Anan uh, report. What I mentioned to the uh, uh, authorities, to the government of Myanmar is that for the first three elements, it is the responsibility of Myanmar to bring back peace and stability, protect the, the people, et cetera, et cetera. What the international community can do is, of course, on the humanitarian assistance as well as on the implementation of Anan report, which I got a lot of support from my colleagues around the world that we are ready uh, to help. And I try also to bridge the communication, the relation between Bangladesh and Myanmar, because I told them that having the good relation between Bangladesh and Myanmar is very crucial to make the situation better. So hopefully that long, uh, the line uh, on the sidelines of the UNGA, then there will be a meeting between the Bangladesh and also Myanmar to discuss about the situation. But one very important issue that should be resolved and addressed by the authorities of Myanmar is, of course, the reconciliation of the relation between the military and the civilian government. Because if the relation is as is now, I'm afraid that the situation will not get better. So again, there is a short-term uh, effort that we have to do, and uh, Indonesia uh, stands ready to assist. And again, we got full support from the international uh, community. But most importantly is how to bring a long-term solution for Rakhine State. And, um, Again, the international community stands ready to uh, assist Myanmar in addressing the long-term uh, solution for Rakhine State. Again, the communal tension in the ground is, uh, remains uh, obvious. And during the last couple of days, I try also to contact the um, leaders, the informal leaders of religious and community in Rakhine State uh, to request them how they can influence, uh, they, they use uh, their influence to ease the tension. Because as long as the tension at communal level is there, then it will also hamper the solution in uh, Rakhine State. So Rod, that is what I would like to what I can uh, share with you about uh, the situation and where, uh, what Indonesia did and will do. We tried to, uh, Indonesia tried to engage uh, Myanmar in a constructive uh, way. We talk also with the ASEAN uh, colleagues, how can we assist also on the humanitarian uh, part and we will have the meeting on the 23rd of September. Thank you. Thank you very much, and um, I, uh, we should all wish you good luck with your forceful efforts in that field as well, and thank you very much for joining us this morning. Thank you. Shall we give her a hand? Thank you. So I will now open the floor for questions and comments, and for those of you who are in the room, um, could you please raise your hand and state your name and affiliation before making your comment and asking any questions? Yeah, you will get a microphone. Thanks, thank you. Uh, my name is Hello? Hello, my name is Garner Janis. I'm a Canadian member of Parliament. I actually wanted to ask the Indonesian Minister a question very quickly before you leave. Because I have some, uh, I do have some major concerns about declines in religious freedom of religion and belief in your own country. Since 2008, you haven't allowed the practice of faith uh, in a public way by Ahmadiyya Muslims, uh, which, thank you. Uh, I don't know if folks heard me. I'm a Canadian member of parliament. I have some major concerns about the decline in freedom of religion and belief in Indonesia. The Ahmadiyya uh, Muslim community, for example, which was referred to today, uh, is not free to practice publicly in Indonesia. Uh, there, the, the law prescribes. Uh, 
up to four years in prison uh, for somebody who who uh, who who tries to con convince someone else to convert. Five years in prison uh, for somebody that that deviates from uh, what are deemed the traditional tenets of different uh, faiths. A and you have your government has imprisoned a hawk, a popular Christian governor, on trumped-up charges of blasphemy. Uh, so it was interesting to hear your presentation. Maybe this presages a a, a, a change in direction, but. Uh, but I, I, I think maybe a show of goodwill today would be for you to, to offer to, to pursue uh, r true justice for a hoax. And I wonder if you could comment on, on what many independent groups would say is the declining situation with respect to freedom of religion and belief in, Indone in Indonesia. Thank you very much. I think we have a bit of an ambush here, but... Uh, <laughs> it's good that you asked that question before I leave the room. Well, first of all, uh, thank you very much for the uh, uh, question. And I anticipated that the kind of question will rise uh, during the uh, discussion. In my presentation, I mentioned that we are facing challenges, as many countries is also facing that kind of uh, challenges. And the case of the, uh, what we call it, Ahok, the uh, previous governor of Jakarta, reminded us, all of us, in Indonesia, that the voice of tolerance and pluralism must be mainstream. Because sometimes, uh, when you are living in, the, in a diverse society, and I, as I mentioned to you, that pluralism, tolerance is the DNA in Indonesia. So people, people believe that it's there, and sometimes we forgot to nurture it, to nurture it, because we believe it's there, but we forgot to nurture it. So all of a sudden, a situation happened. That's again remind us that the harmony, the tolerance is not something that given. It must be nurtured. And there is also some part of the government that has to create the conducive condition for nurturing tolerance and harmony. So again, it is a, remind, a reminder for all of us about the importance of tolerance and uh, harmony. And I think, again, I bring your concern, I bring your voice back home. We are, no, we are not a perfect country, but this is the commitment of the government. As I mentioned, we need as many wise leaders as possible. Because by having many wise leaders, then I do believe, I do believe that tolerance and harmony will prevail. We know the road will be very bumpy, but we have to make sure, to make sure ourselves that we will be there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and my apologies for holding you back. Good luck to you. Uh, do I see any, any other hands uh, in the audience? The lady on my right here. Please state your name and affiliation. Yes, thank you very much. I am Asya Nasir uh, from Pakistan. I represent the Christian community in the Parliament of Pakistan since last 15 years. And my political affiliation is with Jamaatul Ma Islam. That's a religious but political party. I just want to say that I have been part of this group IPP FOB since the first day from Oslo. And we have been really working very hard. And I think that this group has really created impact uh, of which I can give you examples that the letters we wrote. One of the letters was written to Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif when an incident took place when a Christian couple was uh, burnt alive in a Brooklyn. And that letter really created an impact that the Prime Minister, he established a commission for the status of minorities. Today I am a member of that commission for the rights of the minorities. The government is really doing hard because at present Pakistan is facing tremendous challenges. And I think that what we need is we need more support from the international community. 
and from the United Nations because what we feel as a friend from uh, from our, our friend from Iraq said that if the international community would have helped Iraq groups like ISIS and groups like Taliban would have been el eliminated from the world so i think that we need more help more support from the international community to strengthen that since we some parliamentarians and now our group is increasing day by day we have started this campaign we are very much hopeful that a day will come that we all will have one voice that we want peace in the world we want equality and we want freedom of speech and freedom of religion for all thank you very much thank you very much uh, do you have seen any other hands? Uh, we have to close in about uh, 10 minutes, uh, so please be as brief as you can. Can I first go to the lady in the middle there, and then we go to the left? Your name Thank you. Thank Your you name very much. Please. Uh, my name is Fernanda San Martin. I am deputy from Bolivia. Um, well, I am the head of the Committee of Gender Equality, so I'm very concerned about how and what can we do to the panel to, um, with a freedom of belief and religion and belief? How can we guarantee along with women's rights when sometimes that public freedom is also used to control, persecute, or to discriminate women as well? Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Can we then go to the left here? Uh, my name is Ram Chalori. I am from Princeton, New Jersey with the Peace Coalition. We heard a lot about uh, the Myanmar uh, problem today. But what is the UN and International Relief Group's immediate uh, response to create some kind of a safe house for these people to, to, to stay? Thank you very much. I think time now do not allow any more questions. So I will turn to uh, first to um, uh, you, Mark, and ask uh, if you can address the relevant questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I think this question of the free, right to freedom of religion and belief and uh, women's rights in particular is very complex and often very directly misunderstood. I remember uh, once going to some UN gathering and there was a, 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 a UNDP employee from Saudi there. And we were talking about women's rights in Saudi Arabia. And she said, you know, it is quite difficult and we face many problems. But what is this fascination that everyone has in Europe about the way that women dress? It's really not the biggest thing, the problem we face. It's some kind of obsession that you have in Europe with the way that women dress. Um, and it made me see something which was slightly ridiculous about the way in which uh, powerful men all over the world are arguing about whether or not women should wear this or shouldn't wear that, uh, about quite how ridiculous uh, the French have found themselves in the situation where they go to beaches to police how women dress. Uh, and of, obviously, there are many more, much more serious violations in other parts of the world. Uh, the key has to be uh, about understanding what women themselves want as the, as the way in which their rights are realized. And that includes women who choose specifically to identify with a particular religion or have a particular religious identity. The key is not that one form of dress or one form of behavior indicates a violation of rights. The key is whether or not the woman in question is an agent of her own destiny. And I think that is the key also to understanding how we deal with women's rights questions with regard to freedom of religion and belief. Many people say to me, how can you defend uh, religious communities when they are oppressing their women? And I say, well, that's the wrong way of looking at it. We have got to insist on the rights of the woman whether she is a Christian woman or a Muslim woman or an atheist woman. And if we take her human rights seriously, then we will know the answer to the question. 
Um, sir, I didn't quite follow your question about, but I think it was about a safe haven for the Rohingya. Is that, is that right? Uh, whenever anyone mentions safe zones or safe havens, I start getting worried. I, I know that it's for the best possible reasons, and I know it's an extreme situation. Uh, but for workers, human rights workers of my generation, who worked on the Bosnian war and uh, other situations since, uh, including in the Middle East, the whole question of safe havens, uh, which are sometimes established with the best goodwill of the international community, uh, but which the international community is unable to protect on the ground, uh, these situations can be very, very dangerous. Uh, I think we have to insist, as many of you did in the audience, on the responsibility, firstly, of the government of Myanmar uh, to, uh, to, 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 to reverse what it is doing uh, and to put the, for the international community to put as much pressure as it can on the government to recognize what everyone else can see is happening. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Zaid. Okay. Uh, thank you. I'll try and answer a number of different questions and tie them all, all into one response. Um, the linkage between freedom of belief and religion and, uh, and gender equality is a, is a very important question to raise. Uh, it goes almost, uh, it's so obvious because we all sort of sense this, uh, that in many countries, actually it's 147 countries, uh, child marriage is practiced in one way or another. The age of consent is below 18 years old for either the boy or the girl. And what is so interesting, of course, is that the uh, underlying justification is often uh, rooted in some religious invocation. Uh, and yet, at the same time, the Committee Against Torture has uh, uh, pined on this and made it clear that it is tantamount, it is a form of torture for the child where there's no consent given by the child. And no religion would uh, countenance torture as such. And so the fault lines you know, have to be made more clear uh, when it comes to a state's obligations to move forward and uh, change their countries such that they actually uh, meet the obligations as uh, placed in their constitutions and in their uh, civil and criminal codes. The, the problem is not often the law, it's the compliance it's the willingness to go through with it, and it's uh, the uh, focus on appearance. As we've said many times when I, I've come to speak here, you know, there are many countries who invest a great deal in appearance, so feeling they can solve problems through public relations firms, uh, through s slick uh, uh, advertising, in other words. But deep down, structural issues need a, a deeper uh, discussion. In Asia, what could we do more? I think, again, it's working with the human rights mechanisms, filing reports on time, taking the observations of special procedures seriously, uh, taking the whole uh, notion of recommendations under the UPR, the Universal Periodic uh, Review, seriously. And uh, the changes can be quite uh, pronounced if we were to move in that direction. Um, finally, just on, uh, on Myanmar and, and the Rohingya. I said yesterday this before the press, I have no problem saying it again. It's so obvious what is happening. 55 years of the most deep oppression, 55 years where it was almost certain that it was going to provoke a response, and that certainly we do not, we do not support the action of violent extremists. But it couldn't have been a surprise to anyone that uh, starting back uh, last uh, autumn, there was going to be some form of action. And we have been warning for a long time that it's a matter of time before the extremists will just turn up. And then the response, well, the raison d'etre is there. It's a counter-terrorism operation. And clearly, as was said by the foreign minister of uh, Indonesia, completely out of proportion 
to any counterinsurgency operation which you expect would have been mounted had there been such uh, attacks. And so I'm afraid I'm, I have a very cynical view of this. It seems to be the desire by the government to empty the population out of the region, by and large, as Mark said. The real test as to whether this is uh, ethnic cleansing, because it has to be confirmed by a court of law, is how many people they're willing to see returned. If the idea through severe vetting, and it's interesting to see how these terms now sort of cross the Atlantic and are used in other countries, is to only allow a trickle back so that it's not, no longer a nine to one ratio Rohingya Rakhine minority, but maybe something like 40 to 60 percent, then we know what it is for sure, right, without question. I, I think my view of this is you have to stop the killing first. Everything has to be devoted to stopping the killing. And then what you'll see is that, yes, the violence may have come down a little bit, but it's going to be there for a while. Um, and then to assure that everyone who is uh, flushed out is, is allowed back in. We can discuss everything else uh, uh, at a later stage. Finally, on the safe areas, this is a point I would dispute with Mark. The, the problem with Srebrenica, as the report came out, uh, when the report that came out in 1999 showed, was that actually it, it failed spectacularly and horribly in Bosnia and Herzegovina. But it could have worked, and it could still work. Uh, Cornelius Samaruga's sort of pr proposal is not a bad one. But you have to understand what is required for it to work. Uh, it failed uh, in Bosnia because we didn't do exactly what we should, be, should have done. It doesn't mean it can't work elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you very much, Said. Berger, famous last words. Oh, I, I'm going to let you uh, close that. Yeah, I, I also have a bit of a self-interest to be very short, since I'm speaking at a youth uh, <laughs> um, kind of uh, meeting with uh, yeah. my Jordanian uh, colleague. I think this has been uh, very uh, interesting. It is also consequential, this meeting, because we are putting uh, religious freedom uh, on the top of the agenda. And it is such an important part of the hu whole human rights uh, agenda. It should not be seen as a separate issue. Uh, you can not talk about human rights uh, if you don't have a freedom of religion. So these are um, all belongs together. And thank you uh, to the panel. Uh, thank you to all of you. And also thank you to uh, IPI uh, for hosting us uh, this year. Too. So no, I, I give you the famous last years, uh, f famous last words, uh, Tarja. Uh, thank you, Berger. Um, and I'll be equally brief uh, in respect for all of you are going to um, various meetings, in particular for Berger, who's going to his important meeting. So uh, all that remains is to say thank you very much for joining us this morning. I think it's been uh, very candid and very inspiring intervention, uh, interventions. And I also think it's been a very candid and um, to say the least, candid and inspiring conversation. So please join me all in um, thanking our distinguished panel. Thank you so much. And good luck to you all.